Hi, Kinesiology 3030. Welcome to our lecture on lipidology or the study of body fat. Um, so today we're going to talk about what body fat is, how we measure it, um, some of the things to think about when it comes to our human movement when it relates to body fat, because body fat is necessary within our body. However, it is not a tissue that assists with our movement in most cases. Um, so it is not an active tissue. So when we split our body composition together, uh, we have what is called fat-free mass and fat mass. Fat-free mass is our muscles, our bone, our skin, our blood, our organs, um, connective tissue, um, everything that really is water-based and um, in most cases either helps with function or can help with movement like our bone and our muscle, what we've been talking a lot about this semester. Um, the other side is our fat mass, which makes a, or is made up of our essential fat and our stored fat. Essential fat is required for our body's function. Um, so this goes into nervous system function. Um, we have intramuscular fat. We have stored fat um, under our skin, around our organs. Um, comes into our membranes. There's, there's many different reasons why we have essential fat. We also store fat both intra-abdominally and subcutaneously. Intra-abdominal fat is underneath our abdominal musculature around the organs, and subcutaneous fat is underneath the skin in that, that small layer between our skin and our muscle. Okay, so when we look at that makeup, water is made up of most of our molecules um, in our body are, are water-based. Um, we also have like our skeleton, our teeth, um, and then we have things like our organs, our muscle um, that are made up of mostly protein. Um, on our fat tissue side, we have lipids within the cell membranes. Um, we have lipids within our nervous tissue. Um, so around our brain, around our nerves, we talked about our myelin sheath a little bit recently. Um, that is made up of, of fat. We have pericardial fat. So we have fat around our heart um, to give us a quick available energy source to metabolize um, so that we can keep our heart functioning. Um, we have intramuscular fat that is a, a quick available source um, for our muscles to use for energy because fat is really our stored source of energy. We have also so stored um, intra-abdominal fat, what we just talked about, and subcutaneous fat. Um, so here's an example of some intramuscular fat. Um, so these are adipose cells within the muscle, um, which store what are called triglycerides. Triglycerides, we'll talk about in a little bit, they're um, a three-carbon molecule, a glycerol backbone, which is a three-carbon molecule, um, with carbon and hydrogen chains that run off of it. Um, and we use those, we break those carbon bonds in order to release energy so that we can create ATP, so we can create movement. Um, so here's an example of, we can see our muscle fibers and then we can see some fat cells in there too, uh, or adipose cells. When it comes to our body composition, however, most of our stored fat is around our midsection or abdominal region. Um, so here we can see a cross section of a pelvis and a cross section of an abdomen. Um, so this is as if you, you took a person and you sliced them in half and you looked at them um, from the top. Um, we can see all of this light colored tissue is fat, um, all of the kind of dark reddish tissue is muscle um, or organ. And we have bone tissue here, you can see femurs. Um, you can see some um, spinal cord. Um, you can see radius and ulna here and some muscle tissue. Um, but most of that in there is, is fat tissue. We store our fat tissue around our midsection because it is the most energy efficient way for us to store fat and still ambulate and walk around. Um, so fat does not help us move. It does provide energy when we metabolize it for energy, but it doesn't really help us move. So we put our most of our stored fat around our center of mass or kind of the center of us where, where our mass is all averaged out to, which ends up being around the pelvis and the abdomen. Um, so we store it there because it's the most efficient place for us to hold it. If we had uh, fat tissue um, in our arms or in our lower leg, um, that would make those limbs heavier. If we know that if there's more um, mass at the end of our limb, it's very difficult for us to move our limb uh, because of inertia, more mass, more inertia. Um, so we want to put more of that mass at the place that we don't really have to move it as much or we're moving our entire body with that mass. So we store most of our mass around our pelvis and our abdominal region. Um, and really the, that body fat is just stored carbon bonds in the form of lipids or triglycerides. Um, 
And this is this is done within adipose cells or adipose sites. Um, so here's an example image of an adipocyte. Um, these adipocytes have kind of a storage cell, a storage piece in their cell where we can store those lipids. Um, we can increase that storage up to a point, uh, but once we've kind of maxed out the storage within that cell, we have to create a new adipose cell. Um, and as we increase our fat storage, we increase the number of fat cells that we have and the size of those adipose cells. Um, but the, the really difficult part is, is we gain a bunch of adipose cells. They don't go away very quickly. They don't die off very fast. Um, so if we have a lot of adipocytes and then we lose a bunch of body weight, we really just shrink up that storage within the cell. We don't actually get rid of the cells themselves at, a, say, at the same rate. Um, so it takes a long time for us to um, undevelop or, or to kill off those cells. Um, so that's why it's really difficult for people who gain uh, a large amount of adipose tissue or gain a lot of body fat, and then they lose a body fat, lose that body fat, they keep those adipocytes. So it's very easy for them to restore body fat because they have all of these storage cells. It's like buying a bunch of um, storage units and then getting rid of all of the uh, material, but then you just have another place to put all of that extra um, material after uh, you get rid of it. If you try to gain it back, you still have places to fill those up. And we store those lipids um, in multiple places around the body. Um, we like to have blood vessels around those cells so that we can quickly get the triglycerides out of the adipocyte into the blood, into the tissue that requires that energy. Um, so really our, our goal of stored fat is to use it for energy when we need it for energy. Uh, that's why our body stores fat is because our body thinks that we may not eat again. So if we have extra energy that we've taken in, we store it so that we can use it later in the case that we may not eat. Um, so the major source is energy. Um, we have nine kilocalories per gram per of, of fat, as opposed to carbohydrates and proteins as with four kilocalories per gram. So we have over double the amount of energy per gram in fats compared to carbohydrates and proteins. So it's a much more efficient energy um, source because we get over double the amount of energy per unit that we have to carry around. So if we're carrying 100 grams of carbohydrate in our body as opposed to 100 grams of fat, that 100 grams of fat is going to give us over double the amount of calories of energy for us to use. We also use fat as an insulator. Um, it's a great insulator. So gaining body fat can help with temperature regulation, especially in cold climates. Um, we can use it for shock absorption. Um, so it, it actually functions around some of our organs as a shock absorber. The problem is, is when we gain too much, it can compress on those organs. So that's where we see some of those issues. It can work as a, a messenger. So we use actually some of our fat cells are both um, hormonally active. Uh, so fat is um, estrogen, estrogenic. Um, so it helps to produce estrogen. Um, and we also use lipids uh, when we develop hormones. So having low levels of body fat actually interrupts hormone production and having too much body fat changes our hormonal profile. Um, so these are, these are different pieces. Um, it's also used for sport when it comes to adding total body mass. So if we think about sports that require high levels of inertia, so we're thinking uh, sumo wrestling, linemen in football, um, these, these sports, uh, heavyweight wrestling, where we, we need a large amount of mass added adipose tissue can add to that total mass you require for that sport. Or we can have less body mass, um, we would have to lower that body fat percentage. So we talked about it earlier, we, we distribute that fat around our center of gravity. So kind of the middle of ourself around our navel and our pelvis. Um, that is the easiest point for us to hold on to it. Um, this kind of leads into the android shape or the gynoid shape. Android shape is uh, more of a male figure considered like traditionally male figure. Gynoid shape considered a traditionally female figure. So think of android shape as like that apple body where it's a uh, very large amount of mass around the midsection and the waist, um, as opposed to the gynoid shape, which is more of that pear shape where uh, more of the mass is distributed around the pelvis. Um, based on your height, taller individuals will have more of an android shape and distribution of body fat. Um, individuals who are shorter will have a more gynoid shape 
um, and depending on your size of your um, abdominal cavity, the length of your limbs, um, that can all play a role. Um, and then there's this last one, cellulite, which is often a question when it comes to body fat distribution. Um, I have cellulite or, or quote unquote cellulite. How do I get rid of it? What is it? Um, cellulite is really just subcutaneous fat um, that is not distributed evenly underneath the, uh, the skin. So there you can, it gives this appearance of kind of dimples in the skin. Um, those are just kind of the separations between pockets of subcutaneous fat. Um, so it will go away if we lose total body fat. Um, as we, we shrink down those adipocytes, um, it can lower the appearance of cellulite. Um, but it's, it's really just subcutaneous fat, which is our better form of stored uh, fat because visceral fat or intra-abdominal fat um, is, is one that we see as more dangerous uh, as opposed to subcutaneous fat. Um, so it's, it's different ways. Um, but also when it comes to loss of body fat, um, you cannot turn fat into muscle. Um, that's a common myth. Fat does not turn into muscle. We saw adipocytes and muscle cells are not the same thing. We can't switch them and, and turn them into each other. Adipocytes are storage cells. Muscles are, are protein-based um, active tissues that we use to contract. We can't just flip-flop between the two. Um, when it comes to losing body fat, you may have clients or people that uh, will work with you in the future that say, I want to lose this stubborn fat or this um, belly fat or this arm fat. Um, our body loses adipose tissue at a general rate. It does not go spot specific. So you cannot spot reduce fat um, unless like you have uh, some kind of surgery to pull it out, um, but you can't spot reduce fat. Your body will lose it systemically. Um, when it comes to kind of sequence of fat loss, you'll lose um, fat around your distal or kind of further away from your midsection first. Um, so around the face, the neck, um, the arms, the lower leg, then up to the upper leg, upper arm, um, and then to the abdomen and the pelvis last. Um, so that's often why people say, I want to lose this belly fat. You have to lose systemic fat, and then that will come with it. Uh, you can't just lose some fat in some place, but leave it in another place. So what are the results of having too little body fat? Uh, it can influence our membrane structure, so our cells start to change in their form and their function. Hormone production changes. Um, so in some cases, uh, this can be extremely detrimental. We can lose um, the ability to produce higher levels of testosterone in males. Um, you can what cause what is called amenorrhea in females, uh, which is the loss or infrequent menstruation. So you can lose uh, in lower reproductive function by having too little body fat. Uh, and it can also lead to a loss in bone mineral density. So these are all kind of some of those results of too little body fat. It can also cause cardiac issues, respiratory issues, um, and cause early death um, or more acute sudden death as opposed to too much body fat. Um, so it's much higher risk in the short term. And there are some, some major negative consequences that come with too little body fat or lower than those kind of essential levels. So for men, it's around three to 5%, women around eight to 12% that is necessary. Um, and then actual normal body fat percentage is actually higher than that. Um, almost double what we have for essential fat is uh, healthy, normal fat, and even a little bit more than that. So stored fat is not a bad thing. It is good for us. But if we have too much um, or more than our energy demands require. So um, we store fat so that we have enough energy in our body to use it when we need it. Um, if we overconsume energy or food, uh, and do not use that energy and expend it through physical activity, um, we will store that extra, or that extra energy as adipose tissue, which can lead to things like musculoskeletal wear, like arthritis, osteoarthritis, um, because as your body mass increases with non-functional tissue, your bones do not increase at the same rate. So your joint does not get bigger because you added more body fat. Your joint stays the same, and we know with our um, what happens with stress and strain, we talked about in our biomechanics section, if we have now more force being placed on a smaller surface area, that puts more stress on the tissue, which can lead to early breakdown of uh, connective tissue or cartilage. Uh, we can also see this in um, actually in the joints. Um, having too high a body fat percentage can change the metabolism of cartilage 
and lead to early breakdown of cartilage. So there's some other things going on there from a physiological standpoint. It can also lead to cardiovascular disease. Um, so our body, if we have too high a body fat percentage, can lead to things like type 2 diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, um, insulin, ins or insulin insensitivity, um, which is really similar to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Uh, but cardiovascular disease, specifically atherosclerosis, so this is a hardening of the arteries and then a buildup of plaque within the arteries. Uh, if this happens within the heart and causes a blockage within blood vessels, that blood can't travel to the tissue. If that happens in the heart, tissue within the heart will die and can cause with like a, a heart attack. Um, or if we have a blockage in the brain, it can cause a stroke. With insulin insensitivity, especially if we have high levels of body fat, it leads to our body's inability to uh, be responsive to the insulin that we are producing. So our body's going to produce insulin based on our blood sugar levels. If you have high levels of body fat, you often have high levels of fasting blood glucose or fasting blood sugar. So your blood sugar is constantly high. So your body is constantly producing insulin to help us uptake that sugar and use it for energy. But if our body is constantly getting that signal, it starts to kind of suppress the amount that we're sensitive to that signal. So we're unable to take in carbohydrates and use them for energy. They're just going to float around in our blood. And then we're eventually going to reprocess those carbon chains into um, triglycerides, which we store uh, in our adipocytes. Um, so insulin sensitivity, insensitivity is, is one that um, leads to some chronic issues there. And this is going into kind of our, our levels of too much body fat in the United States. Um, so this is a, a 10 years old, but I, I want this as a kind of a good reference. This was 10 years ago. Um, and this number has only climbed. Um, so we're at a little over 30% of individuals in the United States are obese. Um, and 10 years ago in 2010, it was a little below that number is under 30%, um, but it's slowly rising and rising and rising. So we have to think about this from a kind of a long-term health standpoint of society is that if more people have too high a body fat percentage, we see more issues like arthritis, which leads to knee replacements, leads to disability, leads to inability to move around, cardiovascular disease, early death, diabetes, which all add to reliance on healthcare uh, for the general population. Um, and if you think about from an economic standpoint, that's just more money that taxpayers have to put in in order to fund the healthcare that is required for all of these individuals with these chronic diseases that come from too high a body fat. And all of that is, is just having too many triglycerides stored within the body. Um, and those triglycerides are as I said earlier, a glycerol backbone, which is this three carbon, um, and then these carbon chains attached to it. Every time we break down those carbon bonds, it releases energy um, through metabolism. Um, so things to think about, this is an example of an unsaturated fat um, because you can see this double bond um, on the same side. So this causes a little kink in the chain, which means this is a fat that is, um, liquid at room temperature. That's kind of one of the differences. A saturated fat is solid at room temperature. A unsaturated fat is liquid at room temperature. Um, and then if we look at these bonds, this is an example. We have some double bonds here. Um, these are some of our um, essential acids like, or essential amino, or not amino, sorry, um, essential fatty acids like linolytic acid and oleic acid. Um, these are things that we require, but then we have all these others that are kind of, um, we can see there's no double bonds. We see some double bonds here. We don't see any double bonds. So these are examples of saturated fats. Um, polyunsaturated fats have multiple double bonds. Monounsaturated have a single double bond. Saturated fats are solid at room temperature and their carbon bonds are linear with hydrogens on each side, as opposed to these double bonds where you're missing that hydrogen. Um, it's easier for us to metabolize polyunsaturated fats. Um, and we need a, a distribution of both. So saturated fat is not bad. Unsaturated fat is not good. Uh, we need about an equal distribution of each within our nutrition uh, because saturated fats are beneficial when it comes to hormone function. Um, unsaturated fats 
are beneficial in some of our nervous system um, and some of our metabolism. There's other there's other reasons why we need each. Um, so don't be don't be scared of unsaturated fats. Don't be scared of saturated fats. We need about an equal distribution of both. Um, the ones that are a little bit worse are, are trans fats. Um, trans fats are sometimes um, available within nature, but they're often processed through the hydrolyzation of um, these fats to help them to last longer on the shelf. Um, so these are kind of unsaturated fats that are act like saturated fats when it comes to a chemical structure. Um, so looking at kind of some of these functions, they can sit like an, a saturated fat, um, but have some of the markings of an unsaturated fat. Um, these our body does not process as well um, and can lead to kind of some of these chronic diseases. Trans fat has been associated with a lot of these chronic diseases. So here's just some more examples. Um, looking at a double bond on the same side, double bond on opposite sides, trans fats um, and saturated fats, which look kind of like these straight blocks um, rather than these kind of angled unsaturated fats. Okay, so uh, how do we know what our body composition is and how do we figure it out? So how do we know if we have too much or too little body fat? Uh, most adults, a lean, average lean adult has about 40 billion fat cells um, and an obese adult has two to three times that amount. So just having more areas for stored fat will allow for more stored fat. Um, and then if we look at visceral fat, the average male has about 5.4 liters of visceral fat and woman is 3.08 liters of visceral fat. As that number increases, our risk of chronic disease increases more with the amount of visceral fat as opposed to subcutaneous fat. Um, women do carry more fat overall. There's a higher level of body fat percentage in women compared to men, and that is normal. Uh, men also have a higher level of lean mass um, when it comes to makeup of the entire body due to things like higher levels of testosterone um, leading to an increase in muscle mass and lean mass. So that percentage is a little skewed, um, but women also require a high level of body fat or higher level of body fat um, based around hormone and reproductive function. Uh, there are different hormone function for males versus females. Um, so this is just something that we have to keep into account. Um, what is healthy for a male when it comes to body composition is not healthy for is not as healthy for a female and vice versa. We talked a little bit about cellulite earlier. It's it's just subcutaneous fat um, that's causing a, a dimpling within the skin. And then fat distribution is different men versus women. Uh, males have often more of an abdominal fat as opposed to women more have, or more fat around the pelvic region. When it comes to measuring these, uh, you can't actually just physically measure your body composition unless you are dead and you take all of your fat mass and weigh it and all of your lean mass and weigh it. That's really the most accurate way, uh, but we can estimate it. We can use things like hydrostatic weigh uh, because lean mass is more dense than uh, fat mass. So fat mass will float in water. Um, so you get uh, a lighter weight underwater if you have more fat tissue as opposed to if you have more lean tissue. You can use skin fold calipers, uh, which measures the, the thickness of subcutaneous fat in multiple sites of the body. We take those uh, measurements, sum them together and put them through an equation that is um, based on hydrostatic weighing, and we can estimate your body fat percentage that way. Bioelectrical impedance is another version, bioelectrical impedance. We have one of the equipment right here. We have some on campus. Um, it sends a low level electrical signal throughout your body. If you have more fat tissue, fat is insulative, which means it resists electrical signal also. So the more fat tissue you have, the slower that signal will travel, the more lean tissue, the faster that signal will travel, um, which can give us an estimate of our body composition, how much fat we have but uh, it has an error rate of about four to 5% as opposed to hydrostatic weighing and things like uh, the BOD pod or DEXA, which have a much lower error rate. Uh, the BOD pod, we have an example here. We have one on campus. Um, it uses air displacement plasmography. So similar to hydrostatic weighing, um, it, looking at displacement of water and weight, we look at displacement of air and body density. Uh, and DEXA uses x-rays. So we have multiple different methods. Uh, the cheapest form is skinfold calipers. 
um, but it does take some time and training to get those well. The next cheapest is probably bioelectrical impedance. Um, but then DEXA, hydrostatic way, bod pot are all extremely expensive if you don't have uh, easy access to the equipment. Okay, so now what everybody really cares about, what all your clients are likely to care about, uh, how do we get rid of body fat? Um, it comes down to energy balance for total weight loss. Um, so if you want to lose weight, you have to consume less calories of energy than you expend, or you have to expend more than what you consume. Uh, if you want to gain weight, you have to consume more than you expend during your movement. Um, and it's going to happen systemically. It's not going to just target one area. Um, not going to or it's not going to look just at your arms. It's not going to go just to your face, just to your belly, just to your your uh, rear end. It's not going to go to your back, not your your legs. It's going to go everywhere at the same time, um, unless we use something like liposuction, um, which can actually take out adipose tissue and adipose cells in very specific areas. Um, and then uh, bariatric alterations are another one, another surgery. It actually shrinks the size of your stomach. So you cannot consume as much food. So if you consume, if you're forced to consume less food or you feel full sooner, you don't consume as much calories, you're going to lose body weight total. Um, the way to keep good weight, um, healthy weight, while you're losing body fat is to consume a higher protein diet and use something like resistance training so that your body does not lose muscle mass while you're losing fat mass. If we lose muscle mass, we lose functional tissue. Um, so weight loss should come with um, some form of muscle mass retention or muscle mass development type of exercise and movement along with consuming a lower amount of calories than you're expending. Um, and lastly, I wanna talk about this when it comes to, I know this is a, um, a picture here, but this is kind of a, a thought I want you to have is, what is this doing to younger generations? Um, what is this happening or how is this too high a body fat going to impact youth? Um, there is a higher percentage of kids and uh, adolescents with diabetes or with uh, obesity and pre-diabetes than there, there's more now than there ever was before. Um, so think about some kind of interventions, some reasons, some things that we can do to help future generations avoid all of these chronic diseases that come with too high a body fat percentage. Um, cardiac issues, metabolic issues, um, joint health related movement in general. Um, the heavier you are with mass that doesn't help you move, the harder it is for you to move. If it's hard for you to move, it's very difficult for you to go out and exercise and be physically active. You're less likely to continue to do that. Um, you can think about socioeconomic factors, sociocultural factors. There's all of these different factors that play into the rise in body fat percentage of individuals, especially in the United States and really all over the country. You can look at processed foods. You can look at different um, distributions of fat, carbohydrates, proteins within a diet. Um, all of these factor into body fat percentage of the population. All right, that's just something I want to leave you to think about. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you for watching.